Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for the music, for the great music, for the great lyrics, for the truths that we can sing. And <clears throat> we collectively come together on a Sunday morning or anytime we gather and rally together in our faith and <clears throat> various places and stages in the journey. <clears throat> but we all come. And we have those moments, oftentimes, <laughs> every day, where we need you to hold us fast, just to hold us. And for us to be held and to be content there, it seems like we so easily want to squirm out of your arms and leap from your embrace rather than settling our souls within the comfort of your strength and to find our solace close to your heart, Father. We need that. And so this morning, I pray for every one of us here, Father, that we will sense your presence. We will sense your good pleasure upon our lives, Father. That uh, It's not about our works. It's not about our strenuous efforts. It's about what you did for us in your Son. And that we have peace and we have rest and we have uh, our comfort in you, all because of the cross, all because of your Son, all because of our Savior. And so help us, I pray this morning, to rest in you and to walk by faith in you and to put our trust in you and to have that renewed again here this morning. And not just for this moment, Father, but it's more than enough to carry us through the week to hold on to truths that will guide us and will grow us and will nurture us in you. And help us, Father, I pray, in our fellowship with you and our fellowship with one another, just to be found rejoicing in the great things that you have done on our behalf, Father, and to be a thankful people. Be reminded once again of all that you have done on our behalf to rescue us, to redeem us, to save our very souls, Father. Give us a glimpse of heaven here this morning. Give us a glimpse of eternity. Enough not just to fill our souls, but that it overflows. And we leave this place, I pray, allowing some of that to then flow into the life and to the lives of those around us, that we become difference makers for you, I pray. Guide us this morning, I ask, as we look into your word. In Christ's precious, precious name, amen. Well, I have been talking a little bit about out with the old and in with the new, that classic expression we find around New Year's Eve, but we find ourselves, ourselves saying it under our breath oftentimes as we go through the year and as we go through life. As we look at the stuff that we collect through the years, my land, when Terry and I moved up here, when I, my dad passed away and having to go down to his house, and if you've been through that, it is amazing what we collect through a lifetime. The amount of stuff that we collect and stuff into closets, and stuff into dressers, and, and the stuff of life. And then we have the stuff of life, right? And we find ourselves saying, out with the old and in with the new. Give me something fresh. Give me something to get excited about. Give me something to be joyful about. And if there is anyone on the planet who should be able to embrace that expression of out with the old and in with the new... It is the believer in Jesus Christ because Scripture declares that, behold, all things are new. And we can look to the pages of Scripture to be reminded again how with the old and in with the new. Uh, turn with me here this day to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to continue to look at verses 17 through 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 17. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. He's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. 
Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were entreating through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We live in a world that is suffering with an identity Christ. We exist in the church and among believers as we suffer through an identity crisis. Not knowing who we are in Christ and who Christ is in us. And over time we begin to drift and we lose sight of all that he's done for us and all that he is in us. And so Paul reminds us, he reminds the Corinthian church who's in the midst of some division and turmoil and in the midst of that he reminds us of our identity that in Christ and because of Christ and through Christ We all have a new identity. If anyone is in Christ, my favorite expression, one of Paul's favorite expressions, en Christo, in Christ, the hope of all glory. It is a reminder of our position in him, our security in him, our place in him, our identity in him. If anyone, if any person is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, old stuff is done away with. Not put to the side and gently shifted away, but the old things in the aorist form has been done away with. It's just done. Don't need to be reminded of it. Don't need to live in light of it. The shame, right? If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The guilt, the shame, the strenuous efforts to please God, all of that stuff has passed away and has been done away with. The old forms, the old shadows, the old types. That's the book of Hebrews. All of those things were there to point us to the one to point us to the Savior, to point us to the Messiah, to point us to the King. But all those things were in place to remind us of who God is in His holiness and who we are in our unholiness and all that it would take to appease a holy God and that we can't do it. But it was to point to the one who could. And once we put our faith in Him and our trust in Him, All those things are done away with. And quite frankly, that approach to God that we find in the Old Testament is done away with because there's a new approach. There's a new pathway. And there's a peace that we can discover in our relationship with Christ. Behold, the old things have died, you might say. Put to rest. Buried, you might say. But then Paul uses that term, behold, let me grab your attention. Let me grab all of your senses. Let me grab you by the spiritual collar and and bring you into this great truth. Behold, new things have come. Perfect tense. They began at a certain point in time. Upon that moment of conversion, new things have come and they keep on rolling out can never exhaust, can never exhaust the riches that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything we need, we find in Him. Our rich inheritance, our position, our security, our significance, our longings, 
are all fulfilled in Christ. New things have come. I think we forget that. I think we forget all that we have in him. Our relationship with him. The forgiveness that we find in him. The strength. The wisdom. And on and on and on it goes. Far too often, I think, as believers, we live in the shadows of who we were. Instead of looking at the truths of who we are in him. And all that he has for us. And the great reality and the great truth is that we were growing into this. That we're becoming who he wants us to be. And the more we understand and appreciate all that we have, all that he's done, the resources that are available to us to have victory, to have fruit, to make a difference, and to be difference makers for him, if we would just understand it and appropriate that into our lives. Oh, the impact that we could make for the cause of Jesus Christ. Far too often we live in the shadows. Instead of living in the reality of all that we are in him. Paul reminds us that in Christ we have this new identity. It's not about me, it's about him. I have a new purpose. I have a new journey. I have a new king. I'm no longer God. He is. I no longer rule. He does. But Paul moves on. And he reminds us not only do we have a new identity in him? But he emphasizes, not just once, but like five times, that in Christ we have a new relationship. We see that in verse 18. In Christ we have the blessing of reconciliation. It tells us who reconciled us to himself. And Paul's the only author in the New Testament to use this noun and to use this term. He uses it 13 times in the New Testament, five of which we find in this passage, just shy of half. So Paul's trying to make a point. And he's the only one to use the noun reconciliation, katalage, and the verb to reconcile, katalasein. When the verb is used in the active voice, Christ or God is always the subject. He is the one who is doing it. When it's used in the passive voice, humans are the subject. In other words, we are the recipients. God reconciles always. He does not need to be reconciled. We do. And so God reconciles. Man is reconciled. Reconciliation assumes ruptured relationships, alienation, and dissatisfaction. That ruptured relationship is on our end. We are the ones who rebelled. We are the ones who took it all. We grabbed the inheritance, we grabbed the stuff in the garden, and we walked our own way. And in so doing, we rebelled, we rejected and through the course of time, humanity began to ridicule, began to blame, angry at God, shaking their fist in the face of God. And even the best of human souls is guilty before God because they have the audacity to think that they can actually stand in the presence of a holy God in and of themselves and based on their own standing. And as good as we could be, it is never going to be good enough. But the sin of all sins is the rejection of his son. The sin of all sins is to say, I don't need you. I can exist apart from you. Don't tell me how to live. Don't tell me what you think. I don't want to hear from your word. I don't want to have anything to do with you. 
And at best, humanity marginalizes God, minimizes God, manipulates God, and chooses to be God. And so there's this animosity. And Scripture would tell us that humanity is at war with God. It dislikes his authority. It disregards his character. It denies his law. That by nature, we are rebellious and hostile towards God. We see that clearly in Ephesians chapter 2. You know, by nature, we are children of wrath, angry and at war. And as a result, God is displeased with us, but it's always because of our rebellion with him. And yet, look at the one who initiates and secures our reconciliation. It's God. All these things are from God. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. And all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself. All these things are from God which totally takes us out of the equation, now doesn't it? It shows us that we don't have any involvement in this divine activity to rescue our souls. We didn't initiate it. Matter of fact, we didn't even want it. It takes the Spirit of God and the work of God to get into our cold, callous, concrete hearts and begin to draw us in. We don't have a whole lot to do with it. We're going to see we have one aspect in it, and that's it. But everything was done ahead of time for us through the cross. And this whole concept of propitiation, that God's anger and God's wrath was appeased and satisfied through the sacrifice of his son. That whole atonement and all this is from God. And that our Lord, Jesus Christ, being our great high priest, not only offers the sacrifice as our great high priest, but becomes the sacrifice. Not only the propitiation, but the propitiator. As he lays himself down on the altar. And again, the book of Hebrews and all of that imagery to show that Christ is our fulfillment in that. And because God took the initiative with that, to satisfy and appease his own anger. Because nobody else could do it. And he sends his son, who becomes that atoning sacrifice on our behalf, acceptable unto God, and it satisfies his anger and his wrath. That's how that peace is taken care of. But reconciliation is dealing with our anger and our disposition and moving us from a place of incredible hostility and anger and animosity and distrust and exchanges that with adoration and love and friendship and devotion. It's an incredible, incredible work. All these things are from God, which absolutely negates any merit of our own. It's God who reaches down. It's God who draws us in. It's God who reconciles us unto himself, and he ends the war with this most incredible peace treaty that humanity will ever, ever know. Katalasso, to reconcile, in its simplest form, means to make peace between two parties. In its purest form, it simply means to exchange. And it carries the idea of exchanging war for peace, love 
for anger, friendship for enmity. It denotes a transformation of relations. Not in the sense that the original friendly relationship is restored, but in the sense that friendly relationships now replace, replace the hostility that was once there. Enemies are reconciled when their hostility ceases, and then a sense of mutual love binds them together. Take a look with me at Romans chapter 5. Beginning with verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's where we were. And all these things are from God. We didn't have anything to do with that. He demonstrates his own love, his own compassion towards us. And that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than this, having now been justified by his blood, I mean much, much more, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, I mean he's just piling it on, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 18. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly Far, far off. You've been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's the whole propitiation aspect of it. God did this. How? Why? Through his son. Why? To pave the way now to bring us to the place that we can leap into his arms, that we can come with a sense of boldness and confidence before the throne of God and rest in his loving arms. You couldn't do that before. Fear is replaced with this incredible sense of of faith. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one. Again, the old has passed away, the old form, something new has come. And he broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Who can come, who can't? Only the Jews, but not the Gentiles. Only the men, but not the women. All those barriers of age, of gender, of color, of creed, all of them tore down by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, the thing that stood in the way, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into new, one new man, thus establishing peace. And he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you. How many times have we heard that word, peace? To you who were far, far away. And peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you're no longer strangers. You're no longer aliens. But you are God's fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. That's reconciliation. It's bringing us in. It's gathering us as the children of God. I think it's important to note that restoration is more than just an acquittal. God goes to great lengths to restore. Justification is a judicial term used in the courts of law. A judge may acquit an accused person without ever entering into any personal relationship with him or her. State the facts, state the case, I'll render judgment. He just announces the verdict. 
not guilty or guilty. The accused hardly expects to be invited over for dinner by the judge and probably hopes that he will never see the judge again. The change to the reconciliation metaphor takes what God has done through Christ a step further. The judge enters into a personal relationship with the accused. This is necessary because the judge is the one who's been sinned against and is the focus of the personal hostility. God does not simply make a bookkeeping alteration by dropping the charges against us. God gives himself to us in friendship. Because of our extreme hostility towards God, this investment is accomplished at unspeakable cost. I remember hearing the illustration of the young woman who was traveling from out of state through a foreign state and was going just a little bit fast, like 25 miles over the speed limit fast. You might call that overhauling. And next thing you know, she's before the judge. Because she was out of state, the price of that ticket much more than if you lived in that state. She couldn't pay it. Told the officer she couldn't pay it. The officer said, then you're going to need to go to jail, and you'll have to come before the judge. And there she was before the judge. The judge said, you were caught doing 25 miles over the speed limit. How do you plead? She said, sir, I, I plead guilty. I did it, but I can't, I can't pay the fine. I can't pay the fee. And so you have to pay the fee. That is, that is the fee, and that is the sentence. She said, I can't pay it. He said, then you're going to have to go to jail. And you're going to have to spend X amount of time in jail until you can either raise the money or you finish out the sentence. She breaks down in tears. She's got the little kiddos at home. And she's weeping. She said, sir, I cannot pay. He said, I can't change the law. Now she's beside herself. And the judge, moved with compassion, steps up and rises up from his chair, takes off his robe, comes down from the side and comes alongside this young lady, reaches into his pocket and pulls out the amount of money to pay for the ticket, puts it up on his desk, walks back up around, puts on his robe, sits down in the chair, grabs the gavel, says, Your fine's been paid. You're free to go. But Paul would say there's more. Because now it's a young ruffian living out on the streets trying to survive. Broke into the local store. He's dirty and disheveled. Smells to beat the band. And there he is before the judge. Same thing. Massive fine. And he too cries out for compassion. The judge rises up, takes off his robe, comes down alongside him, reaches into his pocket, pays the fine, comes back up to his chair, puts on the rope, sits down. Your fine's been paid. And he looks at the young man and he said, but I've got more. You're not going back out on the streets. You're not going back out there. How'd you like to come home with me? 
Because in my house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I've been preparing a place for you so that where I am, you might be also. So it's more than I just pay your fee. I want you to come into my home and I want you to be my son. I want you to be my child. And I'll care for you and I'll support you and I'll provide truth to you and wisdom to you and your life will never ever be the same. I knew you were afraid of me. I even know that you'd like to run away from me. You'd like to run away from your past. You'd like to run away from your problems. I know you want to run away. But the best thing you could do will be come home with me. And I'll love you. And I'll care for you. I'll clean you up. I'll help you get strong. But that's the difference between not guilty and being part of my home. That's reconciliation. As God's saying, come, be with me. It's the imagery of making up with a loved one, a child, or your spouse. You ever have that moment where you sense that there's a little bit of animosity between you and your husband, or mostly us guys, between us and our wife? You just know something's not right. You're sensing a little bit of hostility, maybe even anger. How do you know? It's not what is said, it's the look. Usually it consists of laser beams. And usually we've done something wrong. We call it keeping our distance. And so you try to approach. But something's not right. And you know it's not right because of this great theological term. Koldos shoulderos. <laughs> or koldeo sholdeo. The cold shoulder. So something's not right, right? But then you come alongside and you say, boy, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do it. And, and so that enmity is removed. The barrier comes down and all of a sudden the relationship is restored again. Or our children come to us and say, Mom or Dad, I'm sorry. You know, I miss you. And you try to get it right, right? And the relationship is restored. It's hard for us guys to admit that, by the way. But it's hard for us as a humanity to admit that. Well, I have more, but not much more time. Look at the means by which reconciliation is accomplished. All these things are from God, who through Christ. That Christ came to a world of hostility. And he came knowing. He came knowing the hatred, the hostility, the anger, the sin, the full weight of it, the blunt force of it. He knew it. But just look at the cross. All of that to bring peace. As I read the passage this morning, you hear that term peace. Peace. Three times in John chapter 20, 
Christ appeared to the disciples. Verse 9, verse 21, verse 26. And he comes to them and he makes this statement. In their troubled world with their troubled souls. And he says, peace be with you. So often we think God is there to judge us, even as believers. And somehow he's up there just waiting for us to trip up and go, aha. It's the enemy, men and women, holding the shame, holding the guilt, holding the consequences. Always bearing down on us, weighing down. The scripture tells us God did not come into the world to judge the world, but that the world would be saved through him. That this cosmic war we're involved in, in a world of many, many wars, the only peace we can know is the peace we find in him. Think about the father and the prodigal son. That wonderful narrative, that wonderful story of reconciliation and restoration, of forgiveness and of grace, flooded with the imagery of a relationship that had gone so sour and so foul, restored and refreshed. The son flooded with all of the love and care from a father who longed for his son to return. So this morning, I just want to end with this comment, this statement. Think of the lengths that God went to in order for us to fall in love with him. Now, we're going to unpack this in the next couple of weeks, but just think about the lengths that our Father took to reach out to the likes of us. Think of the amount of love that was demonstrated in His Son. The lengths, the effort, the cost of all of it. And all this is from God. Think of the lengths that He went to to get us to the place that we would just fall in love with him. And how often we run the other way. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. and a new relationship. And we're going to spend eternity basking in just how amazing it truly is. God wants to know how amazing it is in the here and now. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And as the scripture would tell us, it's only because you first loved us. And if your spirit didn't do that redemptive work, that regeneration, to make us alive in you, oh, my land, would we still be so utterly lost. In our efforts to fill the void, we look everywhere under the sun. We're no different than the writer of Ecclesiastes who went down that pathway in a perilous pursuit to try to fill the void only to discover the emptiness of it all. So Father, help clear the way as you already have to constantly draw us back to you, the best place we can ever be is with you. 
And so, Father, I ask this morning for those that are here that have no peace, that they might find peace in you. That they're here and they don't have a relationship with you. I'm praying, Father, even now that you will draw them to yourself even in this moment. That they're searching. They're searching. They'll find you here today. Help us to be the ones to maybe even introduce them to you. But Father, I pray that all of us leave this place having a sense, a greater sense, a greater sense of your love for us, your desire for us to be loving you. and Protect that at all cost, at all times, and in all ways, I pray. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.